Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. And is there something wrong with your friendship, but you can't figure out what? Are you left wondering if everything's in your head? Unfortunately, toxic friendships happen to everyone, but we seldom pause to identify the underlying issues while we battle confusion or experience the friendship breakup. Too often, we're left bewildered by the friendship's wake, too paralyzed to move forward. Our next guest, Mary DeMuth, has waded through several of her own difficult friendships and knows the pain associated with the loss of a friend. In her latest book, she draws from Proverbs 6 to identify seven types of toxic relationships and empowers readers to recognize the signs of the messiest relationships that may be causing them the most grief. Mary is a writer, speaker, podcaster, and artist who loves to help people restore their lives. She's the author of 35 books, including, including Christian Living Books, Southern Fiction, and Devotionals. She speaks around the country and the world, praying as she goes. She's the wife of Patrick and the mom of three adult children. You can find more at Mary DeMuth, that's D-E-M-U-T-H dot com. Here to discuss her latest release, The Seven Deadly Friendships, How to Heal When Painful Relationships Eat Away at Your Joy, is Mary DeMuth. Mary, welcome to Revealing the Truth. So great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, we are delighted. You have uh, touched on a subject that I think so many people experience in their life, but they just don't understand that there is actually a biblical connection to each one of these type of friendships. And I want to applaud you for taking something that is so wise as Proverbs 6 and looking at it from a standpoint of what God really does detest. It says the, these are the things he, he, he detests, uh, and yet we find ourselves engaged in what you might call detestable in the sight of God kind of relationships and activities that are not what we preached from from the pulpit, but are the reality of life, and we don't see the connection, and you've done an incredible job of making that connection for us. But before we dig into this incredible book, The Seven Deadly Friendships, uh, I want to kind of get your backstory. Uh, how did Mary DeMuth become this uh, prolific author, uh, faith, woman of faith? Uh, where did you come from and <laughs> how did you get here? That's a great question. So I grew up in a home that I didn't want to duplicate later on. Uh, lots of uh, neglect. Um, There's drug abuse around the home. Several different fathers, a death of my father at 10, sexual abuse at five for a year uh, from some neighborhood boys, and just a really unsafe environment. And I didn't know anything about Jesus growing up. It was just not something that was talked about in my home. And really came to that place after my dad died. Um, by the time I was in seventh and eighth grade, I, I didn't really understand why I was even on this earth, except to be hurt and exploited. And so eventually I, I continued to think about how could I take my life, because I didn't know what the point of it all was. And by the time I was in the eighth grade, I had a counselor, a school counselor, who just listened to me and dignified my story. And that really saved my life. It was really helpful. And then by the time I was in the ninth grade, I, I started going to a ministry called Young Life, where they talk about Jesus at the end of every um, every meeting. And I remember just thinking, this is what I have been looking for my whole life. And in the 10th grade, I went to a weekend camp and I heard the whole gospel. And at that point, I... I just prayed and I said, God, would you be the father who will never leave me? Because I was at that point a fatherless girl of several dads and one that was deceased. And and God's been very good to keep that promise to me to be that dad who will never leave me. And that really inaugurated a healing journey that lasts to this day. There's lots of healing, you can imagine, of some of those difficult times. And... Um, so in terms of writing, I have I was an English major. I've always been writing, uh, really wrote for about a decade in the 90s in obscurity, and then um, started being published in about 2004, 2005. So I've been writing about three books a year for 12 years, and that's my primary occupation besides speaking. The Bible studies that you did in Young Life 
and then what really spurred you on to um, dig deeper into the scripture. Was there a particular teacher, influencer, pastor, uh, denomination, uh, theology, any of that which really kind of set you on a path to dig deeper? Because as you and I both know, statistically, according to Barna, about 80% of Christians are biblically illiterate. Yeah, so, it's true. <laughs> so uh, for someone to want to go to the depth and breadth of Scripture and to take even something as simple as the admonitions of uh, Proverbs 6, which most people cannot, off the top of their head, uh, even comprehend what these uh, six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him, uh, and relate that to everyday life, you've gone to the depth of understanding of taking this and applying it to real life practical application, not for the purpose of putting yourself out there as one who's proud and knowledgeable, but one who's actually experienced the failures of each one of these uh, detestable things to God. And when you actually study them and look at them, every one of us has experienced these things that are an abomination to God. But we're not taught that, we're not preached that. How does that tie us to Jesus? Because Jesus actually preach these same messages just in different words. Uh, and so when we look from a life application standpoint, something had to have spurred you on to say, I'm going to take the living Word of God and I'm going to apply it to life. Exactly. Great question. I, um, I was really thirsty when I became a Christian. I longed to understand the Bible. I had this thirst and desire to know it. Um, that started with Young Life. They would have a weekend or a w every week study, and I just started absorbing the Bible at that point. Um, and then it's just actually just been a lifelong pursuit of mine. I would say one of the better things that happened in terms of thinking theologically was that my husband went to Dallas Theological Seminary and got his master's in theology there. And it really, I kind of feel like we both got that <laughs> degree because even though he did all the hard work, um, because it's so much of how to think about scripture really uh came to me at that point of really having observation, application, interpretation, all those kinds of ways of Bible study methods that uh, really have helped me over the past, you know, decade or so to think um, strongly about the scriptures. The other thing I think that's been recent that's been very helpful is I've been reading and consuming large amounts of scripture in short periods of time. So last year I read the Bible in chronological order in three months. So that was like an hour, hour and a half every day. And then I just wrote a book called Romans. Well, I think it's called Grace Every Day, but it takes people through the book of Romans in 90 days. And in preparation for that, I read the book of Romans, all 16 chapters every day for 90 days so that I could get the essence of that book. And I feel like absorbing scripture that much where it's a very significant part of your day and in such volume, you can't help but begin to see the connections between the Old and New Testament and the great story of God and the grand narrative that's there. And so I, I would say that just my own thirst, my husband's theological training, and then just kind of this new practice of reading lots of scripture at a time. Well, it, it, my heart leaps when I hear you say that, so that when I say to you Romans 1.16, <laughs> and you know that uh, that is who I am, uh, right. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation for all who believe. To the Jew first, uh, as a Jewish believer, uh, this was my calling to have an apostolic calling, a Pauline calling on my life to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, Romans 11, of course, uh, this admonition to the church, don't be boastful about your salvation, but you are the branch. And I am also a branch. I am a natural branch cut off from unbelief, but you and I are both grafted in the same tree. And it kind of uh, 
uh, and, and maybe we'll call this a little rabbi trail, it kind <laughs> of should provoke you when you hear anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish language coming out of the church uh, because of uh, possibly the fallacy that the Jews rejected Jesus. For the first century, uh, it was the Jews that accepted Jesus. There were no, uh, Christianity did not come along until after uh, first century Judaism. And so first century Judaism uh, in the believer community, when we take a look at the book of Acts, uh, these are Jews. Uh, when you take a look at the book of Acts, there are 3,000 Jewish people that got saved. This was a very Jewish concept of believing, and at that time, the estimates are staggering as to how many Jewish believers there were. Uh, our backs were broken in 200 AD by Rome, uh, where we had to give up our Jewish identity as Jewish believers and either accept the rule of Rome or die. And so you saw the Jewish belief in Jesus fade away into almost antiquity because of Jewish persecution and Roman rule. So there are so many misconceptions. So as you're teaching on Romans, you're able to break some of these fallacies uh, and really explain why Jesus was handled uh, the way he was in the last four days of his life as the atonement for both Jew and Gentile and the laying on of hands of both Jew and Gentile upon Jesus was the transference of the sin of the nations and the transference of the sin of Israel. This is why Jesus could be crucified within the city walls. It brings a greater deal of understanding to uh, exactly the people that broke our backs. And when the second temple was destroyed, uh, those stones became the Colosseum of Rome. And most people don't know that. So. Uh, you know, that's, it's, it's a, 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 I will definitely have you back on to talk about the release of that book because there's so much that's very personal to me theologically and to my people uh, because I'm a Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled Jew. Uh, I'm not a well, one-off. Uh, there's almost a million of us across the world. And so that's uh, a, a, a fallacy and a misnomer that we have. Uh, we're the ones who rejected Jesus. God gave us a blinding uh, of the eyes and put a veil over our eyes so we not, not, could not see and we could not hear uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles. And uh, that's something that we all have to rec reconcile ourselves that that's the word of God. And he's bringing us back to Israel in unbelief first before he brings us to a nation that becomes saved. So I know that that's uh, a little sidebar, but a good plug for your new book. <laughs> uh, when we look at these seven deadly friendships, uh, I actually want to go to Proverbs 6 because I know that our audience doesn't have it on the tip of their tongue. Uh, but as we look at Proverbs 6.16, 6, uh, these six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. These are the seven deadly, may be coined as the seven deadly sins, the seven deadly friendships, which is what you relate this to. These are attributes of individuals that we have associated with in our lives that we find bring strife, division, and become problematic uh, in our relationships. And you've explored this. What was it that happened to you? Uh, and, and I'll phrase it that way because as an author, uh, we write our books and as someone that preaches and, and host three live talk show segments, three one-hour segments a day, uh, we tend to minister to ourselves first, and the record of our ministering to ourselves through Scripture ultimately becomes a book, uh, where we can no longer contain it to our, just ourselves because it brought healing to ourselves, and now God says, now that you've experienced the supernatural healing, 
uh, I'm now releasing you to share this uh, in, in a way. So what took place in your life that led you to an understanding of these seven attributes and how you were able to connect them to characteristics or behaviors of people in our lives? Yeah, great question. I, um, I have, like you said, I've encountered all these folks. And, you know, I think when we read through books like Proverbs, there's so much wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And we forget that it's actually, a lot of it is relational wisdom. And that's why I love, that's why I love reading through Proverbs. Whenever I feel like I lack wisdom, I go through Proverbs again and again. But it's so surprising how much it talks about relationships, fools, um, who to be in relationship with, who not to be in relationship with. And, and these seven deadly sins are, um, Of course. I mean, I I guess what I used to think is that these seven deadly sins or things that the Lord detests are things outside of myself or they're just out there. But when, um, and I I give credit to the Lord about this because I didn't normally would have, I wouldn't normally have thought of equating these with relationships, but I feel like he just opened my eyes to that because sin occurs within relationship. And so uh, that's where the connection came. I read it and I I was like, wait a minute, this has something really deep. And then um, giving names to those seven deadly friendships and then realizing that I've been in every single one of them. And then, uh, Toward the end of the book, I don't want to leave the reader with, oh, yeah, okay, so I have these <laughs> one of these seven deadly friendships. Now what? But I walk them through three, uh, two very important stories, the important story of Joseph of the Old Testament in Genesis, and then, of course, of Jesus, and both of which experienced these seven deadly friendships and yet walked through it and were able to get to the other side. And... Um, So that's kind of the reason why I did it. The other reason I wrote the book was that I had had some friendship breakups and I went to the Christian bookshelf (laughs) and there's lots of divorce recovery books out there, but there's nothing out there about what do you do in the aftermath of a friendship demise or a relational demise like that. And I felt kind of lost and of course I was searching the scriptures and learning from the Lord, but um, how can I help other people go through this? And now that the book's out, so many people are saying, wow, yes, yes, I've had this, and thank you, and not to give myself any glory, but just, you know, it's it's amazing that we don't talk about these things. You know, it's interesting that I come out of a background of uh, congregational uh, leadership and biblical counseling, and uh, I, I work alongside of uh, and have as guests on my program uh, some of the great Christian counselors of all time, uh, Dr. Ray Jantz, Dr. Larry Crabb, mm. uh, Dr. John Trent, I mean, some really st- names above names that when we think about the top counseling, Christian counseling icons, uh, they've sat in this chair next to me, uh, some who I studied under and studied through uh, into soul healing and to um, real in-depth Christian counseling, deliverance, healing, and counseling. Uh, we've all come across these attributes, uh, and they are all fall into that category of a sin response to some trauma in that person's life. Now, this book is not to make everybody a Christian counselor, uh, <laughs> but what it does is it takes you into an understanding of both the behaviors which are exhibited by these seven particular things that God finds uh, detestable uh, and how they play out in our lives and our relationships and what part we play in either Uh, falling prey to them, enabling them, or exhibiting them ourselves. And so it's not only extrospective, it is also introspective. And I I, uh, appreciate your candor in where you um, reflect upon yourself and your part 
in these various behaviors. Uh, we've got a, a, about four minutes before we go to break, so what I want to do is ask you to um, kind of list these seven deadly friendships um, and if, if you can, just in a couple minutes, kind of give us a little snippet before we dig into some of the depth of each one of these uh, and how you correlate them back to, Pro to Proverbs 6. Right. So these are in order according to Proverbs 6. So it starts with Narcissus Nolan, which is someone who is... Uh, highly absorbed, self-absorbed and self-serving. And even to the point where you might confront someone that's narcissistic and say, hey, this really hurt me. And somehow they are able to turn it around that they're the victim. Um, there's so many other traits, but that's one of the common ones. Uh, the second one is unreliable Uma, and that's kind of the fair weather friend. She's the person who you have given everything to her, and the moment you have a need, she doesn't show up, and then she continues not to show up. So it's one-sided. Predator Page is probably the deadliest of the seven deadly friends. This is hands that kill the innocent. And um, many of us who have experienced PTSD in our lives have probably encountered a predator. Uh, this is someone who wants to take from you, who steals from you, who violates your boundaries and violates you. Uh, con man Connor is someone who takes advantage of you economically. And it's really easy to just say, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's that's not one of my seven deadly friends because I've never been conned. Well, my husband and I have been, uh, and that was no fun. But I bring this also to a, a, a nuance, and that nuance is, have you ever had someone become your friend again after years and years of not being your friend on Facebook or in another place only to sell you something and want you to, to um, buy their product? And this happens quite a bit. And so a con man Connor is someone who only loves you for your economics, who only loves you if you buy something from them. Tempter Trevor is uh, the person that wants you to violate your conscience and keeps pushing. It's like the peer pressure in high school, but it exists in adulthood as well. Faker Fiona is somebody who thrives today in um, social media because Faker Fiona is uh, really able to be a chameleon. She or he can, um, if you have a, a conversation with them, they will totally agree with your opinion. But then you'll see them on Facebook or in other places or with another friend with a completely opposite opinion, just as um, passionate about that because they morph and uh, they stay. They morph into whatever situation they're in. Situational ethics rules the day. And then the last one is Dramatic Drake. Um, this is someone who thrives in drama. And if they don't have drama, they have to create it around themselves. And you often get swept up into that drama. And um, yeah, so that's the seven uh, deadly friendships based on that same, just the same progression that you find in, in Proverbs 6. And uh, hopefully that helps a little bit, and we'll dive in in a, in a little bit. Thank you for that. Uh, it's been very, very interesting that narcissism uh, was an area that I was uh, somewhat unfamiliar with until I encountered it. And then it became, all of a sudden, this uh, uh, epidemic that I began to realize uh, is uh, the byproduct. It is the sin response to trauma. Uh, one of the more predictable, now that we understand it better, one of the more predictable sin responses to trauma. And so when we look at soul healing, uh, that's the, that, that, the, that is the sin response to the trauma is narcissism. And uh, that is, uh, from a biblical perspective, uh, that is uh, the proud look. That is the one that is self-absorbed. That is the pride. And, of course, the same letter in the middle of pride is the same letter <laughs> in the middle of sin. And it's the letter I. Uh, we're talking with Mary DeMuth, author of The Seven Deadly Friendships, <clears throat> How to Heal, when painful relationships eat away at your joy. Uh, this is not uh, a panacea, but it is a outstanding resource to understand what's going on in your life and the friendships you have. Maybe it gives you an opportunity to take inventory of not only the kind of friends you have, but what kind of friend you are. Uh, and that is equally as important as understanding the kind of friends that you have 
uh, is this self-evaluation. There also is on her website uh, a tool that you can use if you go to marydemuth.com uh, of assessing uh, friendship that you might have. You pick a particular friendship and you answer questions in regards to that. And I found that to be an incredibly useful tool. I plugged it into several different people uh, and I was surprised at some of the responses that I got from this quiz. So I want to encourage you to visit her website. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to continue discussing the seven deadly friendships, how to heal when painful relationships eat away at your joy, written by Mary DeMuth. We'll be right back. released book, The Seven Deadly Friendships, How to Heal When Painful Relationships Eat Away at Your Joy. Mary, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Mary, we've all experienced these unfortunate toxic relationships. Uh, usually we find out they're toxic when they are at the brink of breaking or we ended them and we reflect back on them and we realize that there's a gaping open wound left and we have no idea how to heal that wound. Uh, what uh, we have found is an uptick in um, two particular areas that I want you to explore with us. One is an understanding of narcissism. The other one is the drama. Uh, I think that all of us would agree that uh, we don't like dra dramatic relationships. We don't like drama in our lives. It doesn't really matter if you're a drama queen or a drama king. Uh, even they don't like the counter uh, drama that comes with it. Um, they, want to, they want the spotlight on them, and they want their drama to be the focal point. So of the seven, uh, I'd like you to take us down a journey. Uh, take, take us on a trip with Narcissist Nolan. Uh, so, so yes, I will. Um, Narcissus Nolan, and he's named after Narcissus, uh, which is someone who kept gazing at themselves in a pool. Um, he has to have that kind of constant attention. And again, I, this can be uh, Narcissist Nancy as well. So just because I've made him a man doesn't mean that he's exclusively a man. These are traits of men and women. Uh, narcissistic people, and this doesn't necessarily mean someone with NPD, which is Narcissistic Personality Disorder, but there are people that have the traits of narcissism. They have this kind of sense of grandiosity, um, that they're uniquely special and they spend a lot of time talking about themselves. They're jealous of any, anybody else that somehow is elevated above them. They tend to treat people beneath them with, um, with disrespect, but people equal or above them, they will defer to, um, all part of just kind of how they're made up. They also want special treatment. They tend to be in restaurants and really berate servers if things are not exactly as they should be. Um, they tend to lack empathy, like completely lacking empathy. They cannot understand what someone else is going through. They can only understand what they are going through. And, um, they, uh, they're a difficult person to be in a relationship with because it is all about them. They can exaggerate, they cut in line and they don't care. They can't take jokes. Um, and they have to have the best of everything. Um, they talk big, but their actions don't necessarily line up with the words that they say. And, um, they tend to be very smart, uh, and they also love to let other people know how smart they are. So when we get in relationships with folks like this, um, it's extremely hard because people with narcissism are also can also be very charming because they're very good at mimicking behavior that they see. And so you don't necessarily know that they're that way when you go into the relationship. And it's only later, typically, like you said, afterwards, you're like, wait a minute, that was a weird relationship. But in the moment and in the middle of it, you're like, I feel crazy, but I'm not sure why. You know, it's, it's interesting that some of the attributes that we have observed in narcissists is that the uh, ability to spin things back uh, to never taking responsibility for their actions, you are the, always the catalyst 
you being the other person, uh, the target is forever moving. That if you're given a set of instructions today that this is going to make me happy and you do it exactly that way, uh, they'll find a way to show you where you missed the mark. So you then adjust your behavior in trying to be pleasing to them and you do it the new way, but they move the target. They, and it's almost as if the target is on a fishing line and you're ready to take aim, you pull back, you've got it completely lined up to a bullseye. And just as the, as the arrow launches and it begins to approach the target, somehow supernaturally, the target moves over an inch or two inches or even a foot and you miss the target completely and it's because of something that you did and there's this invisible string on that target that makes it so that it's volatile and it's always turned around and it's turned around in a critical way which says that I will climb up on your back to elevate myself uh, to then subjugate you to myself uh, and uh, it's been my experience that those that are narcissistic also demonstrate the uh, second area that I wanted to go into with you, uh, which was the drama. That narcissism, narcissism and drama seem to go hand in hand. There seems to be an indelible connection. So I think sometimes the line gets blurred into is the person being dramatic or are they a narcissist uh, who's a dramatic narcissist? <laughs> yeah, we could make all sorts of interesting connections here by combining different people. And, <laughs> you know, are you a predatory narcissist? Are you, you know, as you said, a dramatic narcissist? Um, yeah, I think you're right. There's, and, and again, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, it's important that we realize that this could be us too. It's really easy to read this book and say, oh, all those bad people out there are this, but what about, and at the end of every chapter I ask, well, could this be you? <laughs> and why is this you? And interestingly enough, um, these are the true that I, the two that I personally have struggled with. Um, a quick little story about narcissism before we jump over into drama, dramatic Drake is that there's a, a, a thing that happens, you talked about the target always moving. Um, I was raised in a home with a narcissistic person and I was starting to feel like I was going crazy because there was so much gaslighting going on, which simply means kind of changing the narrative back and forth in a way that you're, you never know what's true. And so part of the reason I'm a writer today is that I became a really good journaler and I would hear something that that person would say and I would journal it. And then the next day, when I said, hey, but you said that, they would say, no, I didn't say that. I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. I would go back to my journal and go, okay, wait, I am not crazy. And so that's kind of part of the narrative that happens um, with someone that is narcissistic. They keep, like you said, moving the boundaries and changing the stories until you're not really sure and you're off, kind of off your foundation because you don't know what's true and what's not true. So yeah, I love, that's when I started writing, which is kind of funny. Um, in terms of dramatic Drake, um, very good at spinning stories, um, and they are usually wild stories, and um, they kind of get wilder with the telling. Um, they can be the person who cries wolf to the point that you stop listening to them because you think, well, it sounds like they're, you know, they have cancer, but they just had a checkup, <laughs> you know, and you're not really sure, did they really have cancer? Um, they can jump to ridicule. They overreact very easily, and um, a lot of times they'll become evasive when you start trying to not, uh, kind of pin down the stories. There was one woman I was a friend with who she told this amazing story and had me on the edge of my seat. She was talking about um, being in, I think, a, a somewhere like Hawaii, and she was in line at a grocery store, and the person in front of her started accosting her. And I, at the end of the story, I was like, that is an incredible story. What did the other people around you do? And then she just she kind of played her hand. She looked at me and she said, I just made that entire story up, which was frightening because I was all in. I was like, oh, this is the most dramatic story. And it was just that it was a story. So people that are dramatic, you have to be super careful because they don't always tell the truth. So we've identified two potentially toxic relationships 
Um, but it also begs the question as to if these people are toxic in our life, could we potentially be toxic in other people's lives? And, you know, the prayer needs to be, Lord, let there be change, but let it begin with me. So I'm inclined to look at this book, and as I read it, um, we were looking outwardly, but I hope that we're reflecting inwardly and taking an inventory and saying, and as I was listening to you describe, um, I can see in my life where I exhibited some of those behaviors. Uh, just because you exhibit some of those behaviors doesn't mean you exhibit all of those behaviors. But each of us has a tendency in our own way uh, to compensate with um, whatever we conjure up as protection uh, because of vulnerabilities, past hurts, we build walls, we have wounds, uh, we have places that get uh, uh, touched, if you will, and they hurt. Uh, we respond in anger when really the response God wants us to, to respond with is, hey, that hurt, I wonder why that hurt. Mm. Not as opposed to that hurt but to spend the time in self-examination to say, um, what you said hurt my feelings, I wonder why, what is it that's going on inside of me that would cause that statement to hurt my feelings because I know you care for me, you would never say anything to hurt me, but why did that hurt? Uh, that takes a certain level of spiritual maturity in order to arrive at that point. Uh, so. Uh, this also gives us a chance to inventory ourselves as we're inventorying other people's behaviors and finding out if we're, if we're one of the deadly friendships in somebody else's life. And if we really are true believers, we are willing to look at ourselves through the lens of God and examine ourselves before we look outside of ourselves and start pointing the fingers to Narcissist Nolan and uh, to dramatic um, Drake great, to dramatic, <laughs> or Darla, <laughs> yeah, Darla or, or Danny or whoever, uh, <laughs> Faker Fiona and Tempter Trevor and so on. Uh, I think it's an important assessment tool, uh, not only to examining relationships that have been broken because of these behaviors, but also seeing what part we may have played and what part, what, what adjustments, what fine tuning we might be able to make in our own lives. Now, what you've done, which I applaud you to do, is that we are a people who are expert at identifying what's wrong with other people. Uh, nobody on this face of this earth is not an expert at the ability to point out what's wrong with so-and-so, <laughs> okay? Uh, we are diagnosticians, all of us, seven billion of us across the globe, all have some kind of degree in diagno being diagnosticians. We can tell you what's wrong with everybody, what's wrong with their marriage, what's wrong with their life, what's wrong with them. We're pretty good at that. Uh, we are very um, limited in our ability to examine ourselves, but the reality is we do find ourselves in these toxic relationships. We do find ourselves with hurt feelings. We do find ourselves not understanding what happened, uh, but you give us a set of tools uh, after you've identified and you give us those tools by examining the life of Joseph, Jesus, and then you give us seven life-giving practices. And I'd kind of like to, to take you, uh, take us on a journey uh, of how Joseph handled um, uh, and, and which one of these, these toxic, uh, deadly friendships were in his life and how he handled it, uh, Jesus and how he responded, and what these uh, seven life-giving processes, practices, uh, just give us an idea of what that entails. Exactly. And so uh, Joseph did encounter all of those seven deadly friendships, and a lot of them are kind of combined. I mean, you see that um, 
you see that betrayal that he endured. Of course, Jesus obviously endured betrayal too by his brothers. And I think that's something important that we need to talk about is that, you know, I, I narrowed this down to friendship, but a lot of times you, your toxic relationship are, are, relationships are with other people in your family, which is even harder to have your brothers sell you into slavery, but initially want to kill you is um, pretty much a predator page right there <laughs> and some uh, narcissism thrown in there and some drama and some, uh, obviously we've got Potiphar's wife as a tempter. Um, but all sorts of times where Joseph was almost rescued and then not almost rescued and then not, and how all of these relationships really could have made him extremely pessimistic, um, unforgiving, angry, uh, violent, frustrated for the rest of his life. But we see in Genesis 50, 20, where he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring about this present result. And he was able to say, yeah, he was honest. Yes, this hurt. Yeah, you meant it for evil. But had he not done the hard work of forgiveness and had he not done the hard work of working this through and wrestling through with God, he would not have been able to welcome his brothers and his father back with uh, open arms. He would have um, he would have pushed them away and they would not have experienced the salvation of from poverty that they did. And so he just ha has a special place in my heart as someone who has encountered some pretty amazing, difficult relationships and yet came out on the other side as a redeemer figure, which is beautiful. I don't think we think of um, Joseph in regard to toxic relationship. I think we, we've, uh, we've taken a look at him as the dreamer and that he was kind of rash in, in how he shared. It took 25 years of refining from the time he was given the dream to the time the dream was fulfilled in uh, Genesis 50. Uh, <clears throat> putting in those terms of the toxicity of the relationship and how he navigated through that, uh, he ran into several of these people, these kind of people, uh, the lying tongue, the one that mm -hmm. sows seeds of discord, uh, the betrayer, uh, the whole family that uh, borderlined on how dare you tell us um, how you're going to lord over us. Um, who are you? Uh, so was it his pride or was it their pride that caused them not to be able to receive a message from God? We'll never know, but we can certainly mm -hmm. debate and dialogue that all the time. Uh, as we look at, at uh, the life of Jesus, of course, his betrayal, uh, his wonderful uh, release of uh, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, mm -hmm. uh, I think is a good mantra for all of us, is that the narcissist doesn't know they're a narcissist. The liar d and, the, and the, the, the drama, um, if you were to sit them down and talk to them about it and have the dialogue, uh, and, and even if they saw a video of themselves or heard a recording of themselves, they might confess to it, but that's not going to affect change. Uh, is it your hope or desire that this will affect change or give us the tools to affect change in others? Or will this give us the opportunity and ability to affect change in ourselves as we examine our role in friendships, as we assess the deadly friendships that we may have had? Yes, and that's um, kind of the point of the book is this desire to see revival happen starting with me. And what I've been finding um, in my time in the church ha is that so many people are leaving the church and it really has to do with relational discord. Someone hurt them or a leader hurt them or disappointed them and they walked away. And so this is part of my um, kind of handshake to try to pull people back in to help them to navigate the very inevitable thing that will happen to us is that we will be hurt and we will be hurt by Christians and we will be hurt by Christian leaders. What is a good way of walking back into relationship with caution and with our eyes wide open, 
but in a way that doesn't forsake our assembling together, because I truly believe that we do not grow in isolation. And I am at my worst when I am isolated. I am at my best when I welcome other people in to examine me, to love me, to rub off those rough edges as iron sharpens iron. And so this book is my heart to uh, cause people to re-engage, but with wisdom. And um, that means setting boundaries around uh, diff- some painful relationships that are eating away at your joy, you know, as the title says. Um, a lot of times we stay in these very toxic relationships thinking we're being Jesus-y by doing it. But what is happening is we're continually getting harmed over and over and over again so that there is no space or Sabbath or rest to be able to get better. And so then there's no possibility of reconciliation because we're so damaged by the end of it. But taking a strategic break from someone who's damaging us gives us the space to heal enough to be able to see it better and to know whether it's wise to go back in, but there'll never be an opportunity for reconciliation if we're just decimated. And so, uh, yeah, so I want to start revival in relationships, but I want to start it in me, of course. And I have to understand that I cannot be the best friend that I need to be without Jesus Christ. I cannot do it in my own strength. And so the revival comes from me bending my knee and saying, I surrender. I see these things in myself. I don't like them. I cannot change anybody else. I sure can get on my knees and pray for them. And I can create uh, good boundaries around myself. But ultimately, this is all the sovereignty of God and his beautiful plan. and, And let's submit ourselves to that. Have you found in your experience through the process of writing this book that you have been able to become reconciled with somebody who you had a broken relationship with and that that is something that we can look at as a testimony and uh, um, if we apply some of these, uh, we can look forward to uh, fulfilling our call to be in this ministry of reconciliation. That's exactly what... Paul wrote us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 through 6.10 is that we're called to this ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, the whole goal of all of this is for us to become reconciled, not to examine brokenness and diagnose brokenness, but to create a path of healing uh, to bring about reconciliation. So have you seen some reconciliation in your life? I have. Um, There was one particular friend who I had to say, you know what, I make a very bad Jesus. I was, she was coming to me for everything and it was becoming unhealthy. And we had a breakup for a long period of time, but eventually that friendship came back around, which is really miraculous and beautiful. And now we have a very mutual relationship. Um, In a familial relationship that I had, I was I was really afraid, like I spoke the truth into that relationship with as much love as I could, but it broke up completely and I thought for sure it was over. And of course I prayed for reconciliation. Um, And just in the past year or so, things are starting to turn around in that relationship. And the interesting thing that I found was speaking the truth in love did not ultimately damage the relationship. It made a mess in the middle (laughs) and it wasn't very fun for her to hear, but, um, but inevitably God uses truth. And, and again, I don't want to be like a truth bomb and like run around yelling truth at people. I, Paul's very clear about how we are to do that and to examine ourselves first and all of that. So I don't want to, you know, start that kind of a stampede of truth, but, um, but for those who are worried out there, and this is where I really want to settle. If you're worried about speaking the truth in love and your heart is right, really choose to do it because Light thrives in the midst of truth, and it may break the relationship for a period of time, but God will bring reconciliation on the heels of truth much more than he will deception. Amen. Amen. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Uh, I am uh, honored to share uh, Mary DeMuth's new book, The Seven Deadly Friendships, How to Heal When Painful Relationships Eat Away at Your Joy. She is absolutely right. On the shelves in the Christian bookstore, there is not a book about friendship. And all of us have friends, and we see that some friendships are healthy, some friendships are unhealthy. And we are uh, very encouraged here at Revealing the Truth that our good friends at Harvest House have brought us uh, this great author and this great resource. Visit 
ignitinganation.com, click on Books and Media, and scroll down to the green book with the popsicles on it and order your copy today. Mary DeMuth, thank you so much for sharing this amazing story with us and uh, uh, great uh, connection to Proverbs 6. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.